Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. In today's fast-paced world, we tend not to prioritize our own health. Often that's amplified for those that are responsible for others in the workplace or in life. The hardest part about leadership tends to be leading ourselves. And there are specific skills and strategies that we all need to employ if we're busy, but we still want to function at our best. A new study called the Development Dimensions International Global Leadership Forecast found that thousands of business executives and HR professionals around the world are burning out at record rates and that most executives don't think they're effective at leading virtually. Well, with me today is my longtime friend and colleague, Jean-Francois Thibault, or JF as I've always called him. He's a lifelong student of human development and is also an associate and facilitator at Axelite Leadership and co-founded the innovative Lead Yourself Up program that focuses on one clear concept. High performance leadership starts with leading yourself first. His approach to developing leaders leverages business strategy, energy management, neuroscience, functional medicine, emotional intelligence, and more. Now, JF has been helping people for the last 20 years, so today he gets to help all of us. Let's check it out. Hey, JF, welcome to the show. Hey, Mike, really happy to be here. Yeah, it's good to see you. I mean, we have known each other and known of each other for, I mean, we're getting on like a decade and a half, almost two decades. And yeah, we came from a very similar background and you've now migrated into a much broader spectrum of work. Can you tell folks a little bit about yourself and you can start right from the beginning so they can understand just how much work you've done in this field? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so first of all, uh, from the beginning, I was a strength and conditioning coach and migrated into health coaching with like studying functional medicine, uh, manual therapy, posturology. So it was all about uh, helping the old body to be in balance and performance. And I did that for a good 17 years. And I transitioned into leadership uh, in 2014. Uh, so I trended, transitioned into self-leadership coaching. So specializing in emotional intelligence, personal resilience, and apply neuroscience. That's excellent. And I think that you probably came from a similar vein of me when you were working with individuals in the gym and helping them with their fitness. You really realize that it's a much bigger part of it. The fitness is one aspect, but health encompasses a whole bunch of uh, different areas. Can you give some folks some ideas of what are some of the things that you'd work with with somebody outside of just their physical fitness? Yeah, absolutely. So out, outside of the physical fitness, like this, this all like emotional agility aspect and self-regulation of the nervous system. So that's actually a big chunk of the work I do with leaders in uh, leadership training and in one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, also working on the mental aspect. So how to build self-awareness of ourself and how to get back control over our attention. Like everything is competing for our attention nowadays, cell phones, computer, like everything, everybody wants our attention. So how can we reclaim that back? So that's a, a big piece of the work. And how can we actually access the meaning that we give to life and how can we connect ourselves to our core values and take decision based on what's most important for us, our team and our organization. Hmm. Well, that's so interesting because I wonder, because me and you had the same route, you had a fitness facility for years. So for the yeah. background, for everybody listening, me and JF used to do courses with a gentleman named Charles Poliquin, who's really one of the world's best strength coaches. And he used to give us a really hard time, but he taught us a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, it's true. If you didn't make fun of you, you oh, didn't yeah. like it. But, uh, you know, we went through the same thing. You're having a fitness facility. So the question I got is, you became a business person from a trainer. Did you get the idea or become aware of the need for people to have more balance from the people you work with or from your own personal experience as a business person? Hmm. Well, that's a really good question. And I would answer both. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would answer both. Uh, but first, I was really focused on my clients, really focused on helping them achieve balance. And I actually started working with leaders or entrepreneurs from the beginning because they were motivated people. So I was looking for really people who wanted to do the work and uh, be there two to four times a week. And also that they have the invest, like the, the, the means to pay for having this kind of follow up. So mm. I noticed that these people were out of balance and it's only maybe about seven, eight years later that I noticed that I 
started to struggle with my own balance and working 12, 15 hours a day. Uh, it was easy at the beginning when you're in your when you're in your 20s, but when you hit your 30s, it's like, oh, there's <laughs> it's a lot. You need a lot more recovery to be as sharp. And and this is where I started to look and dive deeper into myself and to mm -hmm. regaining my own balance and searching even more first to help myself and then help others. That's right. And, and we're talking about helping others. One of the things I think is important, and before we move on to some of the stuff you're actually doing right now, is you know who are some of the types of people you work with? You've worked with athletes and there's people like, give me some examples so that somebody listening would be like, oh, that's that's me. So this is relevant. Well, I, uh, I worked a lot with athletes in the past. I don't work as much with athletes anymore. Basically, my core now is I work with busy leaders and entrepreneur and self-employed people, mm -hmm. but mostly busy leaders in large businesses. Yeah, right. And, and, and you know, it's funny because we used to do corporate wellness and a lot of the organizations that adopted corporate wellness typically had people at the top that understood the value of, of health. What are some of the challenges that you see these people that you work with facing? Like what, what's the daily struggle for these folks? Well, the daily struggle is mo most of it is a lot of demand, high demand, pressure, deadlines, and one of the things that most busy leaders struggle with is they're addicted to being busy and they don't really notice it. Mm. They just like to do things all the time. And they just feel good when they do things, when they accomplish stuff. And as a result, they don't take time to slow down and they don't recover enough. And they end, they end up being in energy deficit or in adrenaline overdrive, not being able to fall asleep at night or waking up many different times throughout the night. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so they're, they've been trained to accomplish and they've become really good at accomplishing and they focus on that. I think that's the end result, but then they realize there's something wrong. There's something happening with me. What are the biggest gaps you see in these people's lifestyles that are so busy? Well, what's happening is because they're so addicted to be doing some stuff, well, they end up not prioritizing themselves because they think that's not important. So their physical health will pay. They don't eat the right amount of food. They have inability to self-regulate their nervous system. So they, they actually live a lot of stress and mm -hmm. sometimes they don't, they're not even aware that they have high, high amount of stress in their system. So they're not able to identify that because they lack self-awareness mm -hmm. and they are not even able to say like this, what drains their energy and what gives them energy. Right. Right. And I think that sometimes these people that are accomplishing things think they're at their peak performance because they are accomplishing things all the time. But when yeah. somebody isn't in balance, how does that impact them versus what they could be if they were in balance? Like, I feel like they're, they're, they're trading off some of the things that are good for them, thinking they're going to accomplish more, but I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Yeah, I would say that most leader that I work with, they're underperforming cognitively. Mm. They're, they're actually probably performing at 50 to 60% of their best, mm. and they're not aware of it mm. because they never stop. So how can you be aware of yourself if you never stop? Mm -hmm. You need mm -hmm. to slow down in order to be able to stop and see what's happening. So I find that a lot of leaders suffer in their relationship. They, don't, they, they complain not having enough quality time with their family and their friends, even though they value family a lot. Yeah, right. <laughs> they all say they value family a lot. And I know that they care about their family, but because they're so cut, into doing stuff and wanting to accomplish and identifying themselves to their accomplishment, this is one of the, the, the biggest struggles for them. Right. Well, and that's what we're going to try and talk about today is that there's so much we could talk about because, you know, me and you, oh, yeah. we both love this topic, but we're going to try and keep it condensed for folks. How important is physical fitness when it comes to a leader and what does it actually give them? Well, fitness is directly linked to personal resilience. So if you have a resilient body, you will have a more resilient mind. Mm. So it's actually one of the most powerful way to discharge accumulated emotional stress. So yeah. fitness also, as you know, stimulate neurotransmitters that makes us feel good, that helps us to be creative, that helps us to solve problem. And it's one of the best antidepressants if it's not the best. So leader nowadays need to be more resilient. So fitness is one way to achieve personal resilience. 
that was that was really key it said something getting rid of like pent up energy for somebody who's there like i've recently gone through an injury where i couldn't exercise and i found my ability to handle things was less because i didn't yeah. have that outlet especially when you've been active your whole life can you explain how that works in the body for folks because you've said neurotransmitters but maybe they could get a little deeper understanding yeah, so when we actually exercise, whatever type of exercise, we're forcing the body to produce energy. And one way to get rid of the accumulated emotional stress, because when we are stressed, we're just accumulating that energy inside of our body. So the emotions are the language of the body. So when we are experiencing anxiety, frustration, irrit irritability, which is there's a, sur there's a survey that actually demonstrated that most leaders on a daily basis will experience those negative emotion, frustration, irritability, and anger throughout their day. So they accumulate that energy. And then if they're not moving, well, the body is going to start to compensate and the body is going to start to break down because we're not discharging that energy physically. So by moving, we're actually getting rid of that store energy because I don't know for you, but I never learned how to really manage my emotion in a way that I live it and it goes out of my body and I don't feel it anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never I learned how to do that. So people do that instinctively by doing physical activity. And we, I, I hear a lot of people saying like, I manage my stress through, through exercise. That's Jean-Francois Thibault, who's a leadership coach and wellness expert. He's sharing what leaders need to know to function at their best for themselves, their families, and their teams. We'll be right back. We're here with Jean-Francois Thibault, who's a leadership coach and wellness expert. He's sharing what leaders need to know to function at their best for themselves, their families, and their teams. We'll talk about the role of fitness, mental health, nutrition, and balance. Let's check it out. So if somebody is thinking, okay, this is me, I'm a high performing person, but I know I'm missing my fitness. What aspects do you need to put into somebody's fitness regime for it to be effective? Well, when it comes to working out, one of the things that uh, I suggest people is to do in between 30 to 60 minutes of exercise, at least three times a week to really help their overall health and brain health. But I think what's most important is for people to start taking breaks many different times throughout their day on a daily basis. And I suggest, and as the research is showing, to take a 15 to 20 minute break every two hours to move your body, to go take a short walk, to stretch, to do one or two yoga posture or Qigong movement, just to have your body move so it doesn't like stagnate all day long. Because if you're not taking a break, what's going to happen is you're running on stress hormone. Mm -hmm. Your body after 90 minutes is going to start producing more stress hormone for you to keep going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when you are running on stress hormone, you are compromising your executive brain function, such as creativity, decision-making ability, problem solving, capacity to see multiple perspective and discern properly. So you're basically not working as being the best version of yourself. Right. When, you, when you're stressed, your brain says survive, not necessarily pay attention to everything else around you. Even if you think about a sprinter before a race, their vision becomes tunnel vision so they can see what yes. they need to see directly in front of them and where they're going. That's interesting. And you know what else is interesting is that both of us came from a very technical background in training oh, yeah. where we studied reps and sets <laughs> and form. And it was a science. We used to get quizzed on it. And now you're saying the same thing as me, and that is you got to get moving. What you do yeah. is secondary to moving. So how, <laughs> why has that philosophy changed for you as well? Because it has for me. Isn't it funny, right? <laughs> it's so ironic. I know. <laughs> well, it started to occur to me in 2011, about like I would say 10 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, when I, when I to, to, to go back to what I was saying to you before, when I started to notice my balance go drifting away. Mm -hmm. And I remember one year I had such a hard time like doing workouts in my own facility because my employee came to me all the time. My clients came to me all the time. I was not able to, to do two sets without being disturbed. And at some point I stopped working out. I was yeah. pissed. Like, yeah. and my solution was just to go and do spinning and outside of my place 
and I, which I was doing twice a week. But before I started back on training, it took me months to give myself the permission to train for five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes and to make it count. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, I noticed that, wow, I don't need 60 minutes of exercise, let's say. I just need like a few minutes and my energy shifts completely. My mindset shifts completely. I'm uh, more calm, more grounded. I saw the impact of doing short amount of fitness workout or whatever mo movement there was. So that really opened up my eyes and shift completely my perspective. And this is another reason why I wanted to chat with you today, because I always have experts on in different areas and having somebody like yourself who has gone from the ultimate level of performance training to this is an important message because in the media still, there exists this pressure that people yeah. have to be in a gym. They have to be doing it under a yeah. certain formula. And can you please set the record straight on, is there a magic bullet in a program? That's the thing. Like I, I don't agree with that message that we need to be in a gym. We need to be lifting weights. Yes, optimally, if we were going with all the research, this is maybe the way that you would get the most bang for your buck, the better return on investment. But the thing is, as human being, we need to love what we do. We need to make it simple, accessible, and easy. And sometimes going to the gym, especially nowadays with this pandemic, like <laughs> this has been such a big struggle for a lot of people that used to go to gyms that they were like kind of left out yeah. and not, not knowing what to do. So what, what I suggest people is to give themselves permission to reflect on what types of exercise energizes you. Is it group training? Is it going for dance lesson? Is it going to do uh, exercise outdoors? What energizes you and how can you implement more of those moments on a regular basis in your weekly routine okay so that's perfect that means the next point talk about consistency because i love the fact that doing what you love will allow you to do it more but how important is consistency when it comes to all this i think it's vital consistency like our body works on rhythm all the time all day long you know so the more consistent we are the more stable our nervous system becomes and the, the more predictable it becomes to our body and the more predictable it is, the less stress our body will produce uh, because it doesn't know what's going to happen. That's right. Okay. So here's one thing. It's, it's intimidating for people to ask for help, in particular when yeah. you're dealing with people that are successful in day-to-day -day life. And now all of a sudden they're like, okay, I'm not in balance. And listen to this. What's your advice to somebody who might be really insecure because they're really good at a lot of stuff, but they're really crummy at this, but they got to take that step. What do you tell them? Well, first of all, you have to accept that you need help. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a better person, well, you need to ask for help. Mm -hmm. Because on our own, we don't have a good track record as human being. But first of all, we need to accept, and specifically for men out there, because we have been socialized to be strong, to not be vulnerable, to not show weakness, to not be sad. So we, we have been socialized not to ask for help because it would mean that we're weak and we're not good enough. And this is bullshit. Sorry for my language. No, that's yeah. true. And, you know, it is funny. And, and as we get older, we have to ask for more and more help because we aren't as strong as we were. And we start getting different challenges. So it might not be a twisted ankle. It might be heart disease and a bad doctor's report. And that can be really scary for people, but starting somewhere is important, especially physical fitness. And so I want to go into that. When people's health starts to change, when they start to realize they're not in balance, when they start to realize that maybe they haven't had physical fitness, that may cause stress. So let's talk about some mental health. Um, yeah. You know, how does gaining more balance in your life impact a person's mental health? Well, it's everything. Hmm. Like our mental health is directly connected to our body health. And if our body is not healthy, our mental health is not going to be there for us. So finding balance, having enough, and I would define balance, like having enough recovery period throughout your day, throughout your week, in order for you to be able to renew your energy reserved. Mm -hmm. So if we are running low on energy, our mental health is going to struggle. 
Mm-hmm. We're going to be more fatigued, more t- towards t- towards depression, t- tending towards like uh, feeling lost or uh, not having the resources, the necessary resources to face the dif- different challenge that we have in life. So energy is such a big component. And if we don't recover enough, our energy reserve are going to be drained. Right. And, and, you know, if we're drained or we've got too much pent up energy that isn't being released, I know that, for example, when I'm stressed, I don't think that's straight. But you also mentioned emotional health and emotional intelligence or EQ. Can you explain exactly what that is for people? Emotional in- intelligence has many different categories. And what I would like to talk about is emotional agility. So mm-hmm. our ability to recognize what is the emotion that we're living in this very moment. Mm-hmm. Because we haven't been trained for that. My generation, your generation, let alone older people haven't been trained to recognize what it is that I'm really feeling right now and how can I acknowledge it and how can I gather the information, the wisdom that this emotion is trying to communicate to me so I can actually act in alignment with what I need. Mm -hmm. So this emotional agility, first of all, is to start being aware of how am I feeling and to name it. Name it. Is it frustration? Is it uh, the irritability? Is it sadness? Is it overwhelm? Like what, what it is? And emotions are subjective. If I show you the wheel of emotion with all the positive and negative emotion, and I ask you to pinpoint what are you feeling right now? Well, you're going to take a moment to identify like, am I feeling good? Am I feeling lower in energy? Am I feeling uh, more angry? And then what are the specific emotions that are connected to those broader categories? So being able to name the emotion has been shown that it actually reduced the intensity of the emotion by 50%, Mm -hmm. just naming it, just saying like, I'm feeling frustration right now. Well, you're already 50% less frustrated if you're naming it Mm -hmm. and if you're just present to the emotion. Well, there's a big thing I always heard and it's called unconscious incompetence. So if you don't know what you don't know, you can't do anything about it, but you can become consciously incompetent and you can say, Hey, this isn't right. You know, it reminds me of that kid's movie inside out, which I think everybody should watch because it's got these blatant emotions, but you realize a lot of things are combinations of these. If somebody is able to name this and they are cognizant of this, how do you see that translate into somebody's daily life, in particular, somebody in a work environment? Well, it changes the game because if I'm able to be accountable for my emotion, I'm able to take the necessary action based on what this emotion had to communicate to me. So let's say I'm frustrated because someone overstepped my boundaries or I overstepped my own boundaries. I can actually see, oh, I didn't put boundaries and like someone just overstep my own boundaries. So what, what I need to do is next time I need to put some boundaries. So uh, people know what they are because I haven't put any, or I'm, I didn't make them clear. Well, now I learned something about myself and I can take a, a proper action to mediate that. So it doesn't happen again with, let's say that specific person or with my team or with my boss. <laughs> Well, if you're naming it too, you could say, oh, in this circumstance, I do get frustrated or I do get anxious or I do get angry. And then you're able to recognize the situation and say, hey, wait, it reminds me of football. Somebody sets up a formation. They're about to score a touchdown on you. They score, but now you can shift your defense for once. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're responsible for how we are reacting, but we're not responsible for what is triggering us. Like we got many triggers inside of us, but how we're reacting to the trigger This is what we're responsible for. That's Jean-Francois Thibault, who's a leadership coach and wellness expert. He's sharing what leaders need to know to function at their best for themselves, their families, and their teams. We'll be right back. We're here with Jean-Francois Thibault, who's a leadership coach and wellness expert. He's sharing what leaders need to know to function at their best for themselves, their families, and their teams. We'll talk about the role of fitness, mental health, nutrition, and balance. Let's check it out. 
You teach people to be aware of their emotions. We know that some of these emotions can be amplified by a lack of physical activity and getting energy out, but now they're starting to address that and they're still feeling these things. How do you help people navigate these and what sort of tools can they employ outside of just naming it? Well, there's many different tools. First of all, yes, there is naming it, being more cognizant, being more conscious of where they are throughout the day. So I ask client or we teach people to actually do check-ins with them many different times throughout the day, specifically before they get into a new meeting with someone, check in their emotion to make sure they're in the right state to enter into that meeting, to have the impact that they want to have. So naming your state, checking in, and then if you're not in the right state, let's say you just got out of a meeting and then you're irritated. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you need to do in this very moment in order to self-regulate your nervous system and come back into a centered and grounded place so you can step into that next meeting being the best version of yourself? Mm -hmm. So how would I do that? I mean, I've heard deep breathing, all these different techniques to be able to calm your nervous system. I come out of something, I'm going from one class to another, something happened and I was late. How do you do that in a very quick period of time? So if I'm listening to this, what, what technique can I employ tomorrow if I'm going into work? Yeah, very good question. So it depends on the intensity of the, the emotions that you are living. The higher the intensity, the more you need to move your body okay, to discharge the emotion. So one thing that we teach people to do is if they feel a really high surge of emotion inside of themselves, well, it's just to go for a brisk walk or just jump on the same spot and breathe deeply. To, so uh, increasing the breath out will help the nervous system to calm down faster, okay? Mm -hmm. Another technique is also to wider your gaze. Uh, this is also something that's going to relax your nervous system. So if you want to look outside and wider your gaze and really increase your perspective, your visual field, this is something that's going to relax your nervous system. And then uh, doing two to three minutes of deep breathing uh, in, a, in a more relaxed way and asking yourself, what is my intention for the next meeting? Mm -hmm. How do I want to show up? So connect your mental aspect to your physical aspect, your emotional aspect. So you come in in a centered way, mm -hmm. in a centered state of mind and calm. That's true. I've heard things like, uh, you know, pick up a leaf on the ground and look at every single detail on it so that you're fully aware of things you never would have noticed because your brain will filter out that information. Yes. Now, if I'm at a workplace and maybe it's a stressful workplace and I wanted to integrate something there for meetings or to center everybody around. Are there some simple things that workplaces can do to change their culture around this? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things that we like to uh, propose people to do is to enter a meeting doing a check-in. Mm -hmm. So to let people the five, 10 seconds to just check in with their state, just naming their emotion. So everyone goes around and just name it like uh, I'm feeling optimistic or I'm feeling irritated or I'm feeling drained or I'm and just naming the state for everyone is going to help them to just to calm down the notch. OK, mm -hmm. and as a leader, I'm going to know what's the temperature in my room, mm -hmm. because if I'm there to give a bad news or face a challenging situation, Maybe I need to do uh, a minute or a two minute breathing with everyone before I get into that. Be because if I dive in right away, chances are it's not going to be successful because people are not in the right state of mind to tackle that difficulty or that have creativity to solve the problem. Right. Well, you also said naming it for yourself helps reduce it. But if I let you know that I'm irritated right now, then you can also be cognizant of that and sensitive to that, which allows yes. you from triggering me unintentionally. Exactly. So that creates what we call resonance. So I'm aware of your state, you're aware of my state, and then we can have empathy for each other. Mm -hmm. But it's an explicit, it has been said, you know, so it's not me in my head saying like, Mike, Mike doesn't look good today. Like he's uh probably frustrated, you know, when it's not the case at all, you know? Right. So yeah. the more people can voice their emotion, the more I can know, like, uh, and understand your physiology and your energy when you're in that state. So I'm, I'm building a better attunement to you and I can enter into conversation in a better way and a more effective way.
I love that. I think that's so important. It's just being sympathetic and understanding to other people. And again, allowing them to be themselves without being imposed by anything you, you feel at the time. Um, okay. So we've, we've talked about fitness. We've talked about some mental health and some emotional intelligence, something I'm really passionate about. I know you are too, is nutrition and how it impacts our day-to-day life. What's your philosophy on how important nutrition is for us? Nutrition is vital as the building blocks of our body. Like if we're not getting the right nutrients into our body, our body is just not able to function properly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And it's funny because we came from that school too, where nutrition was a big part of the training we went through. Uh, That's the one thing that stuck with me that, uh, yes, I can give design a killer program for somebody in the gym, but nutrition (laughs) is, I'm still hardcore in nutrition because it makes you feel like a better person. How does it play a role with our physical performance, but also our mental performance? It, I think nutrition outside of an external event really triggering for you is the thing that can impact your body the fastest. Mm. Mm-hmm. Like in less, if you have a, a non-proper meal or a non-proper snack, you're going to feel it in less than 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. You're going to see your energy either falling down or you're going to see your energy really being like overwhelming, like too much energy, like that sugar rush yeah. that people will have. Like that, that's going to affect your brain right away you you might like if you're having this coca-cola with that snickers you know it's just like a sugar rush right away you might feel like really energized for 15 minutes and then your body starts to crash and then you start feeling irritated you start feeling more of that fatigue coming in slugginess confusion brain fog it's going to impact directly your ability to do your work we work mostly cognitively nowadays Mm -hmm. So your cognitive function is hijacked. Your emotions are hijacked. Your body is hijacked. Yeah, right. Exactly. And so, okay, it's a very complicated topic, though. So instead of diving into like macronutrients and biochemistry right now, how do you start them on eating better? Fundamentals. Yeah. I, I think, first of all, I talk to people about hydration. Are they drinking water in their day? Because if they're not drinking water they're probably mildly dehydrated and this will reduce their cognitive function by 30 to 40%. Mm-hmm. That alone, just hydration. So this is one of the first thing is, are you drinking enough water? And then I will go to sugar. How much added sugar do you have in your day? And if you don't know, you must start to read the labels on what you buy because chances are you're having probably 100 to 150 grams of added sugar a day when I suggest people to have in between 30 to 45. Mm -hmm. How important is it for people to make sure they have a balance if they're trying to build a stronger body? Yeah. And, and before even going into like macronutrients, the other thing that I would talk about is green vegetables Mm -hmm. to have enough green vegetables because they are super rich in phytonutrients. They're super rich in magnesium. They're super rich in nutrients and antioxidant that our body needs to fight daily stress. So the, the vegetable aspect, I'm, I'm, I'm coming from Charles' uh, mentality and other people in functional medicine field. Like I aim to have eight to 10 portion of uh, vegetables in my day, which is, which is a lot for many people. Mm-hmm. So having half of your plate to a third of your plate that are vegetables, I think it's one really good habit to keep in mind. Mm-hmm. And then macronutrients, protein, carbs, fat. So drink more water, eat your veggies. These are things we've heard before. Eat frequently. You know what I mean? Like make sure yeah. it's a good building blocks. But when you combine all these things together and you got somebody who might not have been cognizant of these before, can you give me a couple of like real life examples of, of, of how you've seen this change people? Oh, I have so many, I have mm-hmm. so many real life example. Like I, I, most people when, uh, in the first month, when you only change their breakfast and you make them drink more water, if they weren't drinking enough, most people energy level double and they all lose weight. They will lose in between three to five pounds of weight mm-hmm. in the first month, just doing that. N- no physical exercise, mm-hmm. j- just doing this because their body was just starving. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and you give them like hydration with in water, we have oxygen. And this is the second way to bring oxygen to your body is breathing and then drinking water. And if you're uh, eating more green vegetables and you start your day balancing blood sugar, your body's happy. Your body is giving you a high five every single day. That's Jean-Francois Thibault, who's a leadership coach and wellness expert. He's sharing what leaders need to know to function at their best for themselves, their families, and their teams. We'll be right back. We're here with Jean-Francois Thibault, who's a leadership coach and wellness expert. He's sharing what leaders need to know to function at their best for themselves, their families, and their teams. We'll talk about the role of fitness, mental health, nutrition, and balance. Let's check it out. Do you have an example of a real life person that actually came in and, and maybe wasn't sold in the concept of what happened to them when they actually got everything in balance? How did that impact their family life and all these things that may have been suffering before? Yeah, that that happened many times, actually. One guy that uh, comes to mind is it was a salesman uh, have his, having his company working 60 hours a week all his life and wanting to lose weight and not able to lose weight. He was 230 pounds. He tried everything, was not able to lose weight. And the first month, um, we, had, we had him just drink more water, changing his breakfast, and um, going for more green vegetables. I said, just twice as much green, green vegetables. And in a month, he lost 10 pounds mm-hmm. and his energy level was higher. He was able to, and that's the funny thing, is because his body was regenerating, he was able to rearrange his working schedule and work less hour and have more results. Mm-hmm. because he was more there mentally, he was more focused, he was communicating in an easier manner with his wife, with his employee. So it, it, it literally, after a month, he came back to me as like, you changed my life. I said, mm-hmm. I did nothing, you did it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you had it's breakfast. Just, yeah. yeah. You, well, you changed your breakfast, you started to just put more attention to yourself because this is what happened when we start training, when we start uh, attending to our nutrition, we're actually paying more attention to ourselves, giving ourselves more love and attention. And that in itself is creating results. I love that. And you know what else is interesting about that? And I tell this with exercise with people all the time. I always start people with nutrition as well because when you start to fuel your body and you have the right energy levels, exercise becomes easier and you feel better. You lose yes. a few pounds, you're lighter. That hike becomes easier. Your body isn't working as hard. So there are really simple things. The other thing I think is really interesting about your philosophy that's gone, I, I, our philosophies have literally developed in parallel. We almost like, I, I, know. I, I everything is crazy. <laughs> and we haven't chatted for a I long know. time, which is really wild. And that is that people will likely get the same results by doing two or three small things than they will being perfect. And they're because perfect is probably going to deter them and they're going to quit. Yes. You know, do you, do you experience yeah. that too? Oh yeah. yeah. A lot. Yeah. Too many times, actually too many times. Yeah. yeah. And I so. remember when I started, you know, when I started with Charles mentality and everything, like I was so a surgeon with people giving them like a specific recipe. Uh, and I, I had less results. Yeah. 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 Because it only works with certainly highly motivated folks, but ultimately we don't need all that because we're not trying to get to 99% to 100%. The people that I really hope get something from this are the people that are right at the 50% line and they need yes. to get a little bit, but they want to move to the right side of health. They don't need, they, they, they're on the teetering. They could go to poor health or they could go to good health, but they're on that right side. And so, you know, what encouragement would you give those people that, have been excluded from wellness because they really weren't even in the spectrum of being like sold to. Well, I would say to give themselves permission to try for 30 days in a row to do those habits, to try for 30 days in a row. And if you skip one day, you start over the 30 Mm -hmm. days. And when you're able to do 30 days consistently, to do one, one or two of those habits, which are not going to take much time in, their, in your daily life. It's going to be transformative. You're never going to go back, but you need to give yourself the permission to 
at least experiment it and see the, the impact that it can bring to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So let's recap everything as a little closing thing. We talked about emotional intelligence, talk about naming things, we talk about taking breaks and centering yourself. We talked about the importance of fitness and we talked about the importance of nutrition. Walk me through what a quick day looks like where I'm cognizant of those three things so that anybody can put it into real life action. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I wake up in the morning and then I have my breakfast. Mm -hmm. First, first of all, I'm, uh, I'm buying a bottle of water so I can know how much water I drink. I start my day and I drink a five ml of water so I can reach my two liter if I'm a man or 1.5 if I'm a woman early on in the day. So I can, I can quantify that easily. I'm more aware of my emotion because I get into uh, the habit of checking in with myself. How do I feel uh, before the different meetings or before the different events that I go to in my day? And then I take a moment to breathe deeply, just to be aware of my breath, to calm myself down and to come back into a neutral space if I need it before I get into a meeting. So that th this is three example of how you can integrate that in your life starting today as you're listening to this. Well, ironically, I stand up when I do all my interviews for the radio show to give myself, give myself a little bit more of that physical uh, activity. And yeah, somebody gets a chance, they go for a walking meeting. If it's a nice day out, you can have a yes. meeting. It's better than being inside and having a mask. You can go outside, go for a walk. If you're allowed to and you're able to, that's another way to get some activity. But none of that is difficult. It just requires a bit of trying. It's like riding a bike. Riding a bike becomes super easy after a while, but at first it's a bit wobbly. And I think that's what I encourage people. Yeah. And it requires intentionality. Yeah. You need to be intentional about it. It's not just going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. You need to be intentional about it. Okay. So one more question is if I'm trying to make a change, how important is it to have people support you and to make it known that you're attempting to do it, to be brave enough to sort of share that with people? I think it has a huge component. Uh, huge importance because when I name what I'm working on, first of all, I'm claiming it. Like people know I'm, I'm holding myself accountable in a way because people will know and they will, they will get back to me. And if I choose the right people to help me when it's going to, the tough's going to get going, uh, it's going to be much easier for me to stand back up and start over, mm -hmm. you know, beginning again. And I think it's vital to have, if you don't have like a, a personal trainer or a personal coach to have people in your network that are, that they love you enough to keep you accountable. They love you enough to hear when it's tough and they're not going to be like in solution oriented mode all the time. Just going to, they're just going to be listening to you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we just need to be listened to about what's not doing well. And then when we said it, Right away, it's clearer and we can start over. Exactly. We can solve the problem just by hearing it. Uh, JF, if somebody wanted to reach out and get a hold of you to get some advice, how do they reach you? Well, they can follow me on LinkedIn. I'm posting regularly on the topics that we, uh, are, we, we did speak today. And uh, I invite them to also watch our free masterclass on how to thrive at work and in life without compromising the business results. And they can uh, watch that at leadyourselfupnow.com. Mm -hmm. And also they can visit our website, axolightleadership.com. I'll be sure to post all that on social media. But I got to say, buddy, it's been a long time. It's fantastic to see you. I love what you're doing. I think it's such a great, uh, important uh, service for the knowledge that you have in your head. So thank you for sharing that with us today. Hey, thank you, Mike. You're a really inspiring leader. And Keep on the great work. Uh, you've been really inspiring me all those years as well. So I'm glad and so happy to be on your show today. Thanks so much, buddy. Thank you to JF for coming on today to talk about the various ways we can balance our lifestyles so we can work hard and we can play hard. Now, if you want to reach out to him, you can find him on www.axeliteleadership.com. That's A-X-E-L-L-I-T-E leadership.com. Focusing on the fundamentals like hydration, movement, checking in, and prioritizing our own health were key messages that resonated throughout our conversation. For those of you that hold productivity in high regard, remember the saying that health isn't valued until it's lost. Just something to keep in mind. Well, I hope you learned something new today that you can start applying in your day-to-day -day life tomorrow. Well, that's our show. 
I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of the Wellness and Healthy Lifestyle Show on your VOCM.